Angels Care Home Health, serving Hayes and the surrounding areas, is a Medicare-certified home health agency providing quality skilled nursing and restorative therapy services to patients in their homes. They're polite. I mean, they just take the time for you. Angels Care is there to help 24 hours a day, and all services are covered 100% by Medicare for patients who are eligible. I like the Angels for what they've done for me. Angels Care Home Health. We serve patients. Eagle Community Television presents Community Connection with your host, Mike Cooper. Hello and welcome again to Community Connection from Eagle Community Television. Thanks for watching and thanks to our producer of the series, Jeff DeRall, along with the help of Jordan Schaefer today. We are at the Kansas State University Agricultural Research Center just south of Hayes with the staff assistant, Joe Becker, who is also the K-State Weather Observer as we talk about prisoners of war in Kansas, 1943 to 1946. And before we visit with Joe, I do want to send a special uh, thanks to uh, the beef cattle research scientist here at the K-State Ag Research Center, John J Yeager, who uh, uh, was not able to be with us, but who provided us with a good amount of the research and uh, literature and information, photos and other uh, uh, memorabilia here of this particular event at the K-State Ag Research Center. Uh, we are at the Ag Center on the second floor of, where are we, Joe? What is this? We call this the dairy barn, or the hay barn, the big barn. Uh, this is the hay loft, and this is where we house the prisoners of war in 1943 through 45. This is where they slept. This uh, particular location, the hay barn, has quite a history itself, doesn't it? Oh yes, this used to be actually the, uh, the hay barn for the dairy, which was a mile south. Uh, in the uh, 30s, they split this in half and moved it up here for use of the feedlot facility because we were no longer in the dairy business. And so uh, they put it back together and here it is. You mean they actually moved this entire structure in two parts from what, a mile yes. to, the, to the north, I guess, right? To the south. To the south. Yes and put it back together again Yes. for the hay barn. Yes. That's an amazing story. Just one of the many moves that took place over the years here at the K-State yes. Ag Research yes. Center. We're using as reference today on the uh, Community Connection a uh, Prisoners of War in Kansas 1943 to 46 publication which was done by uh, K-State uh, Publishing out of Manhattan uh, and the authors Lowell May and Mark Schock who put together a fascinating history of the prisoners of war who were in Kansas. Let's begin at the beginning here. How did they wind up at the Ag Research Center? There was a labor shortage. Uh, our guys were off fighting the war. Uh, we needed to continue our work here and uh, uh, according to the Geneva Conventions we had a source, a labor pool of people uh, who were German prisoners. Uh, that uh, were located at Camp Concordia, and at Con uh, just east of Concordia, Kansas. And uh, we had requested, actually we had requested both German and Italian prisoners. Uh, and, and when it finally came after the paperwork was all uh, finished, uh, we were giving 100 prisoners from Concordia in 1943. They arrived in September and they were here uh, through uh, uh, to the end of November, I think uh, first of November they left. Uh, but within that time they had contributed about 20,000 man hours of labor in this part of the county, or in Ellis County and Rush County. And here in the hay barn was actually the place where uh, they, uh, they were kept, right? Yes, we had bunk beds uh, lining the walls and uh, we'll see later there's wires where they hung their clothes and uh, this is where they stayed uh, overnight. Uh, we had a mess hall in a building to the south here, um, and uh, uh, this is where they lived. There were also showers, a washroom on the ground floor, and uh, a, really a barracks for the prisoners then, right, Joe? Yes, this is what this was, yes. Now, at the time, the uh, Ag Research uh, Superintendent was, and help me with pronunciation here, 
Lewis Eicher? Aker. Aker. Yes. Lewis Aker, uh, who was uh, the station superintendent, along with Frank Wassinger of Hayes and Abe Schneider, a former Rooks County legislator and farmer stockman, met with Frank Blecka, state supervisor of emergency farm labor, discussing the placement of the German and Italian POWs, but eventually only German uh, POWs yes. came here to the station. And again, we're in the time frame of 1943 to 46, right? 45. 45. 45, yes. Um, what did you discover in other research as it relates to the housing of the prisoners, what they did, uh, how they were fed, those types of things? Uh, we fed them in our mess, but uh, most likely they were actually more uh, excited to actually go work for the farmers in the outlying areas because they actually were fed better. Uh, the, the farm wives knew how to, uh, to feed these guys because they were young, they had voracious appetites, and uh, to keep them working hard, they uh, fed them well. Uh, and these were foods that they were kind of acquainted with, but uh, there was one that they didn't know anything about, and that was gravy. And they always let that aside, and finally mm. one day one of the wives uh, took a ladle and spread the gravy over his uh, potatoes, and they were like, what is this? And after that they were fans of gravy. They couldn't get it, they had to have gravy on everything. That was a fantastic story about yes. the gravy. <laughs> but yeah, that was one of the meals that they really looked forward to was the noon meal at yes. uh, the host uh, farm family. Yes. Uh, our, uh, our budgets, we always have budget issues. Uh, we were uh, confined with just the bare, bare minimum and knowing mm -hmm. that really when they needed a good meal was actually in the middle of the day. Well yes. now once again in reference to the Lowell May Mark Shock uh, publication Prisoners of War in Kansas, uh, which uh, John uh, Yeager had provided for us, they were accompanied by at least one guard and uh, since this was the first time prisoners of war had been used at a branch camp, no one knew what to expect. But it was interesting that there were no problems. That's right. Uh, we had, I believe, a hundred, over a hundred guards here at that time for the first, uh, for the first year because they did not know what to anticipate. Uh, we did not have problems due to the fact that uh, it seemed familiar to them here. Mm -hmm. uh, the people had names mm -hmm. that they were acquainted with. Some of them could converse in German. Uh, uh, they were either Catholic or Lutheran, uh, which we both have uh, the churches for both, so they could uh, attend services. Um, and they felt, they felt secure, they felt at home. At first, uh, they, they kind of were uh, hesitant, I believe, because they thought we were I think they were afraid they were going to be eaten or something. We mm -hmm. were, we were uh, very hostile. But when they found out we mm -hmm. were just regular people and uh, that they were treated well, uh, which was a statute of the Geneva Convention, that uh, they were willing and they were actually glad to work. It gave them something mm -hmm. to do rather than being bored. And so they uh, worked on the farms uh, with the fall harvest and uh, uh, were glad to do so. And uh, Lieutenant N.A. Boyles, again quoting from the uh, publication who commanded the camp at Hayes, described his German charges as ingenious and industrious. The POWs were educated, their average age was 23, and they were combat veterans of the Tunisian campaign. Rations identical to that of the American personnel at the nearby Walker Army Airfield. So yes. there was really a kind of a connection, wasn't there, Joe? Yes. Yes. Uh, we did have to provide, according to the Geneva Conventions, we had to feed them the same as we fed our own soldiers. We actually paid them a wage, and, uh, uh, and so they, they did earn uh, money. Uh, part of it went to the canteen to supply for, the, uh, for their food, but also uh, they were able to, uh, to save this and uh, uh, use that for uh, when they go back to Germany. Once again, according to the publication that we're quoting from, uh, apparently 150 German prisoners from Camp Atlanta in Nebraska came back to the uh, 
Research Center at a later time, a different group. Yes, uh, this, the next wave came and they actually stayed for two years. They never, they never left. Um, these were older guys. I don't know mm -hmm. what their average age was, but they were a little older. And uh, I think they were from the Normandy uh, uh, prison group. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it was a little different group, but uh, uh, the same. Uh, and at that time there was a change. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, they realized that there wasn't going to be major issues. I think they had uh, uh, already uh, had uh, taken their problem people out of these groups. Mm -hmm. And so basically, they were just the uh, regular soldiers, the privates. And uh, they, uh, they were, they, they, where were they going to go? They were in the mm -hmm. middle of the U.S. Uh, and so they did not really have guards go with them any longer. They could actually go with the farmers and do their work. They, they had to be back by sundown, and uh, there was never any problem. You mentioned also, and uh, the book quotes the fact that there was never an escape attempt, there was never a death among the prisoners at any of the times that they were actually here as POWs. Well, as such, on paper, there was one time Two guys went downtown and had a soda, and then came back. Oh. They had some money. They they went back. But yeah, that they, was their escape. Yeah, right? that was their escape, and they came back. They laughed. You know, you always have to test the system. Ah, but okay. uh, anyway, they're got their kids. You know, uh -huh. they were young. Yeah. But uh, yeah, and there were probably some girls that they were wanting to go meet or something, <laughs> I suppose. But anyway, that was. But as such, no, there was no. Uh, actual uh, conscious uh, uh, attempt to actually flee from here. As a final couple of minutes here in our visit with Joe Becker from the Agricultural Research Center, let's talk a little bit about the connectivity with the religious aspect because they could see, for example, the cemeteries in Liebenthal had very much similar markings on the graves and stones that they were familiar with in Germany. And they also, I understand, because of the reference to the uh, publication again, uh, they asked for mass uh, almost immediately when they got here. Yes, yes. Uh, and they actually did work at uh, Thomas More Prep School, mm -hmm. and they did work for the parish, uh, St. Joseph Parish here, which was the... Uh, the uh, main parish here in Hayes at that time. They did work for them as well. And uh, exactly what they did, I'm not sure, but I'm sure it was, it was uh, maintenance related. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were industrious. Uh, um, we actually have a building that they built here at the time. We, have a, we had a garage that they had built. It's, has, we, it still exists, mm -hmm. but it's since moved and is in private ownership. But we have pictures of them, photos of them building it. And uh, they also were involved with the construction of uh, six pit silos that were located south of what was the mess hall at that time. And uh, uh, they, uh, which was something innovative at that time. It didn't necessarily work uh, later mm -hmm. on, but this was something they were trying uh, the, at, in the, at the station here and uh, they were involved with uh, constructing those and um, so we put their talents together. The, the yes. ag, ag Center benefited as well as the area farms uh, from their uh, labors. Oh yes, oh yes, uh, very much so. Uh, I don't know how they would have got, gotten everything accomplished in the fall uh, without them. Joe Becker, weather observer and uh, the staff associate at the K-State Ag Research Center, south of Hayes, our community connection. Angels Care Home Health, serving Hayes and the surrounding areas is a Medicare certified home health agency providing quality skilled nursing and restorative therapy services to patients in their homes. And the angel care nurse come to see me once a week. Angels Care is there to help 24 hours a day, and all services are covered 100% by Medicare for patients who are eligible. Angels Care has helped to, to stay home. Angels Care Home Health. We serve patients. Hello and welcome again to Community Connection from Eagle Community Television. Thanks for watching, and thanks to our producer of the series, Jeff DeRoll. Also to uh, uh, the extended help today of Jordan Schaefer, from Eagle Community Television. 
We're visiting with uh, dairy farmer Bob Binder, who uh, has an integral part in our presentation of the German POWs during the time of their incarceration in the K-State Ag Research Center facility, known as the Hay Barn, uh, from 1943 to about 1946. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, Bob was a young man at the time uh, with the Binder family, uh, with the dairy operation, and uh, has some memories he wants to share with us. About how old were you at the time, Bob? Well, I wasn't a young man. I thought I was. <laughs> But uh, I was only uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 12 years old. Uh -huh. But I do recall um, coming with my dad and, and his brothers who farmed as a partnership. And uh, they would pick up the prisoners and take them out and they'd work all day and, and uh, bring them back in the evening. How many were involved uh, in the operation, if you recall? At the Bob? time, there were three brothers. My mm -hmm. grandfather started the operation. It was Joe Binder. And then uh, as, the, as the young, his sons uh, got married and, and started farming, they became a partner to the operation. Mm -hmm. Finally, Joe stepped out and there were three brothers. A fourth brother was in the service mm -hmm. and uh, served in, uh, in the European uh, theater. He, uh, after the war, came back and joined. So there were four brothers. Uh, eventually, there were four brothers in the farming operation and they were called the Binder Brothers. What uh, brought about the, uh, the inclusion of the German POWs in the farming operations in this area was a lack of uh, uh, work. I mean, there just, there just uh, weren't any of the guys around because they were all in service. So do you remember some of those times? I do, yes. I remember before the war, uh, my younger uncles, my dad's younger brothers, uh, would be working on the farm. Uh, they weren't part of the operation, but they were working there. Well, they got drafted to the to the service, and so there was a lack of help. And uh, it was kind of a godsend that the prisoners were here mm -hmm. because uh, um, we needed the labor, uh, laborers, and certainly um, it worked out for both parties, I think, because I know that the German prisoners enjoyed coming out and working for us. And I know that Joe Becker mentioned earlier something about the food, the dinners, and so mm -hmm. on. They did, uh, they did look forward to those. And of course, my family is German. And uh, the fact is my grandfather came from Germany when he was five years old. Mm -hmm. um, so the food was, was uh, of a jo uh, German um, or orientation and and so consequently uh, uh, and we never fed them in the house we there were too many of them too many the brothers the binder brothers and and the help and the families themselves uh, were too many to put in the small ho homes we had mm -hmm. so we'd have it out in the shed someplace and the women would prepare the food and set up the tables out there and, and they'd all come in and eat and they enjoyed it now one of the things that that uh, I remember and my grandfather could speak German. Now, I didn't know that until I was in high school because he never spoke German. He never. He, as a, as a younger man growing up, he spoke German to his parents, mm -hmm. who obviously only spoke German and not English. And as he got older and got married, he spoke English. Mm -hmm. My grandmother spoke German. And my dad, when, when, when my dad spoke to his dad, my grandfather, mm -hmm. he spoke English. When he spoke to his mother, he spoke German. Oh my goodness. And so my grandfather could understand every word they said, uh -huh. the German prisoners. Mm -hmm. So could my father. And uh, his, his two brothers, one of them could quite well, the other one not as well. But uh, they could understand and they could visit and they could talk about and they could talk about Germany you mm -hmm. know because yeah. my grandfather even though he's only five years old did remember you know what the lay of the land was mm -hmm. and so on in in Germany and uh, the ironic thing was that uh, I can recall one incident where uh, my, I recall my father talking about it um, there were German officers inspectors that used to come around occasionally and check on the farms and on the prisoners themselves. Mm -hmm. And I remember one time a big black, I don't know, was a Cadillac Lincoln or a big black car anyway. Mm -hmm. and, 
and had flags on both fenders, one German and one, one American, mm -hmm. and drove in and in through the yard and up into the field and right to where the prisoners were working. There was about six of them at the time and uh, boy, as soon as they saw that car, they dropped everything they were doing and stood at salute uh, Heil Hitler. Uh -huh. And uh, the officers got out of the car and they, they uh, saluted. And, and officers, I can remember, had shiny boots. They were dressed to the, to the ten, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, they came over and they discussed the conditions of the work and the um, housing mm -hmm. for the prisoners. Now, my dad and my grandfather could understand that. The prisoner, the, the German officers didn't know that. Uh -huh. So they asked some personal questions and of course, so after they left, there was some discussion between the prisoners and, the, and my grandparents, my granddad. And uh, they admitted that, that uh, they were not spied on, but checked on, mm -hmm. uh, you know, every so often just to see what the conditions were. And he said, but we don't have any complaints. Now, I remember uh, I overheard Becker saying something about no escapes, and that's true. However, there was an opportunity that I can recall my dad talking about that uh, they could have because they were working north of Hayes about 10 miles, and there were about six of them in the group. My dad and his brothers were there. They went in for lunch. After lunch, they went out and laid under, it was summertime, they laid mm -hmm. under a tree for a few minutes just to rest their, their, uh, their lunch. Um, the guard set his rifle next to a tree and walked away from it, mm -hmm. maybe 10 feet. And my dad said, why wouldn't you jump over and grab that gun and try to escape? He said, as Joe said, where would we go? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. yeah, we're in the middle of the United States. We might make it to the ocean, mm -hmm. but that's as far as we could go. Mm -hmm. So they asked him whether he knew anything about the rifle. And he asked the guards permission to use the rifle, and he did. And he went through whatever they call the crack platoon thing with the rifle. Mm -hmm. And he made it, he made it talk. I mean, he just, it just, as compared to our, our military people who were not on a regular basis, mm -hmm. they, they were just drafted and were in the service and learned how to shoot a gun. But, mm -hmm. But he could he could make it uh, he could make it just like it was part of himself. Much more professional. Much much, than. More, much more professional. And uh, when he was done, he set it down next to the tree and came over and laid down under the tree. Oh my! So yeah, and they, as Harold and I were talking earlier, um, later they didn't send guards out with them. Mm -hmm. We we worked a number of people without guards, uh, and incidentally, they didn't know about. Uh, rattlesnakes. They, they had no mm -hmm. idea. Now in our area where I live we don't have them but west of us five or six miles there were rattlesnakes and we, f we farmed some of the Krauss property uh, mm -hmm. up in that area and uh, one of my uncles and, and one of the prisoners were up there loading bundles of feed and they run into a rattlesnake and the, the German prisoner was going to grab it pick it up and the, my uncle yelled at him and said, don't touch it. Mm -hmm. Well, they killed it, and he wrapped it in a roll and laid it on the passenger side of the truck. So when they came home with the load of feed, and my dad came out, and, and uh, the prisoner got out and said, get in. My dad said, no, I'll just stand on the side. He insisted, no, you sit in the seat. So they, he sat in the seat, and the prisoner hung on the side running board. Well, as they got out to the, the stack where they were going to unload it, uh, the prisoner, my dad hadn't noticed that snake. The prisoner kept quizzing him about, you know, rattlesnakes and, and are you afraid of snakes and that type of thing. And finally he said, well, look down at your feet. And my dad looked down, there was a rattlesnake laying right at his feet. <laughs> now they, they, you know, they liked to have fun and, and, uh, and joke and, and we enjoyed them very much. It was a real connectivity. Wasn't it was. It and, and I guess maybe we might have felt a little closer because we were of German descent, sure. and they were German, mm -hmm. and so maybe we had a, a, you know, an association with them that, that a lot of people didn't. But around here, most of the people were German and descent. So there, uh, there were, as we mentioned, uh, there were uh, uh, the uh, cemeteries, there were the churches, there were the symbols, 
There was the language, there were the foods, there was a real connectivity. There, wasn't there was, there? yes, there certainly was. Uh, uh, it, it, you know, until you called the other day and asked me to be part of this discussion, I hadn't thought of it in quite a number of years. But uh, after our telephone conversation, I start reminiscing, uh, mm -hmm. you know, of the, th the things that happened. Mm -hmm. And there were a, a lot of little stories that, that uh, you know, I remember then. As, uh, there was one farmer around you here. We got one more. There we was, got time for another okay. one. Okay, there was one farmer around here, and I certainly won't mention his name. Uh, and he's passed away many years ago. Who complained to my dad that they don't work very well. They would work good in the morning, but not in the afternoon. They'd play around and sh uh, shocking feed. They'd set one guy down and then they'd chalk around him and he'd bounce up and knock it all down. And they were just playing. Well, come to find out that he didn't feed them very well. Uh -huh. So they mm -hmm. did enjoy the food and they mm -hmm. did want to be fed and, and they were humans, so mm -hmm. why shouldn't we? Mm -hmm. You know? Amazing story. Did you ever, as that young person, uh, have a, a direct react or direct interaction with uh, any of the prisoners? I couldn't speak react? the language, um, and I certainly couldn't understand it either. But, but I was around them. Mm -hmm. I, I was a little, I was a little lad, and and I, you know, be among them. And mm -hmm. my dad and his uncle, his brothers, and we were all in a groups, you know. They were kind of like older brothers, weren't they, to an extent? I was, I was, uh, well, I was always a curious kid. I. I had to have my nose right in front of everything, you know. I'd be pushed back. <laughs> Parents, my dad was always pushing me back out of the way. Uh, but yeah, so I was right in among them, and, and they were just, as far as I was concerned, they were just another human being. Bob, did you ever remember if your dad had any future contact with them after they had been returned? I'm, I don't. My dad didn't. I think possibly they wrote to my grandfather. Uh huh. But they could write in German, and my grandfather could could read German. Uh -huh. And amazing. so they did write to him, yes. Well, an amazing story, Bob. We thank you very much for sharing it with well, us. I'm uh, certainly happy to be part of this discussion, and and it's a, it's a time in our, our history that is very uh, important to remember. And something that we would never think about, I think, probably. Today's but, generation so doesn't know anything about it. Prisoners of War in Kansas. The reference material was from Lowell May and Mark Schock from the Kansas Publishing out of Manhattan, 1943 to 1946. Uh, farmer Bob Binder joining us today as our Community Connection. There's more ahead. Angels Care Home Health, serving Hayes and the surrounding areas, is a Medicare-certified home health agency providing quality skilled nursing and restorative therapy services to patients in their homes. They're polite. I mean, they just take the time for you. Angels Care is there to help 24 hours a day, and all services are covered 100% by Medicare for patients who are eligible. I like the Angels for what they've done for me. Angels Care Home Health. We serve patients. Hello and welcome again to Community Connection from Eagle Community Television. Thanks for watching and thanks as always to our producer of the series, Jeff Durall. And thanks to Jordan Schaefer too who joins us from Eagle Community Television as well as I guess we could say co-producer. Uh, with us today is uh, former Ellis County Commissioner Harold Krauss, also a uh, gentleman farmer. I think that's fair enough, isn't it? How's that, Harold? Retired. Okay. See, I followed that script exactly like Harold wrote it for me. 16 <laughs> years as Ellis County Commissioner. Also uh, bringing us some memories of uh, the German POW encampment in Kansas uh, through the K-State Ag Research Center, the years of 1943 to 1946. And we've used as a reference source, as we've mentioned, the Prisoners of War in Kansas, 1943 to 46. If you've not read this, it's through K-State or Kansas Publishing Incorporated out of Manhattan. It's by Lowell May and Mark Schock, and it is a fascinating recount of the events that transpired uh, during uh, World War II. One local rancher, we're quoting from the publication now, recounted the number of prisoners told him that they planned to save the money they earned working in the United States to give themselves a fresh start in post-war Germany. 
Another local commented that some prisoners wish to remain in America after the war, settle down in a German-American community, and marry a local girl. Harold, I'd like your reminiscing as uh, Bob Binder has done about uh, the experiences with the Krauss farm. Okay. Well, our farm goes way back. Uh, actually, my great-grandfather immigrated from Deutschland mm -hmm. in uh, 1856. Came to Scranton, Pennsylvania. Uh, well, he came through Castle Gardens in Manhattan and then Ellis Island wasn't operating yet. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, went on and worked steel mills in Scranton and got a wife along the way and uh, she was from Austria mm -hmm. and um, so uh, they farmed in Illinois for a while and then they worked in the slaughterhouse in Chicago and went on to Ankeny, Iowa and farmed a little there and they heard that there was Germans uh, down around Ellenwood mm -hmm. the railroad was complete down there to Ellenwood mm -hmm. at that time, but it was under construction from there on west. Well, we don't know how. Uh, he went down there mm -hmm. and all the land was taken, he said. So he uh, uh, somehow got to Rush Center and I saw him along the construction of the railroad. He probably got a ride on a wagon or something. Mm -hmm. He walked from Rush Center to, to Hayes and came up uh, right near Bob Binder's uh, homestead there and everything, but that was, I don't think they were there at that time yet, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, later on, the Binders and Krauses, uh, my great-grandfather and his mm -hmm. grandfather were very good friends. Yeah, you guys have got quite a history. Yeah, yeah so we, we don't tell stories about <laughs> each other. <laughs> Some things are off limits, <laughs> right, Harold? But, uh, uh, so <clears throat> we, uh, that was in 18, uh, uh, 76 uh, mm -hmm. when he uh, homesteaded mm -hmm. south of town here and uh, four miles uh, right on the Munger Road mm -hmm. and uh, where one, Munger and 183 are now mm -hmm. and uh, so uh, we uh, that was our start in the family and then uh, but then um, my grandfather moved farther west in the county and uh, uh, established a farm uh, south of Yosemite, uh, and uh, so that's he, two of his brothers are in the same area. There was a spring there, and they mm -hmm. had water and so on. So, uh, our farming is from the beginning, basically. Mm -hmm. So, what's your first memory of the arrival of the German soldiers, Harold? Um, it was quite a uh, you know apprehensive, especially to a young kid and fifth or sixth grade, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, the uh, walker was being built and I remember the B-17s mm -hmm. constantly in over Hayes and then mm -hmm. later the B-29s and mm -hmm. and uh, we were all uh, aware of the war. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but one thing once apparently uh, when they announced that the, so, uh, the prisoners had come here, uh, we were extremely short of labor, especially uh, for the physical work, the hard work. And uh, uh, the, in high school, 16 years and older, the boys worked on the railroad in the summertime. Mm -hmm. they, they didn't, you know, they, there wasn't anybody else to do the work. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, even junior high kids, uh, some of our class, my class, uh, uh, helped weed the, the uh, nursery here on the experiment stage just grows trees here. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a lot of handwork in that. Well, mm -hmm. not so much labor, but it's handwork. Mm -hmm. But so a lot of this was, uh, uh, we, we needed help, especially in the fall harvest mm -hmm. we had because we put up silage. Mm -hmm. And uh, those bundles of green sorghum uh, were, were awkward to handle. And uh, part of the part that went into the silo was all uh, fresh cut uh, the same day and it goes through the cutter and into the silo and makes insulage and for the dairy cattle. It was uh, really labor. Uh, wasn't it, it? it was labor intensive mm -hmm. and uh, my dad had had to make a choice of, of uh, two of my brothers they were of draft age as mm -hmm. to which one he could keep and which one had to go to the service and mm -hmm. already my brother John had, was in the service so uh, 
dad uh, chose by his brother Kenneth and uh, Warren went into the Navy. So that's, that's how the uh, labor situation was and dad was with needed help. So, um, How did he contact uh, the people to get the prisoners uh, to, to help at the farm? Well, they, they had a system mm -hmm. which you reserved so many. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it was very, at the first, uh, it was uh, about one guard per six prisoners, uh, very, very clean, close. And uh, they, uh, the, the first year, there was tension, you might say, or apprehension uh, about security and things, but uh, uh, from the very beginning, they ate their meal in our, around our table mm -hmm. with the family. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, one time, uh, uh, and they were, uh, they would talk among themselves. My dad talked very low German. He, uh -huh. he could understand the German and, and Munger, but he couldn't understand the German and Katarina stuff. There was that high and low <laughs> yeah. German, wasn't yeah. there? Uh -huh. So, uh, <laughs> So the ones from Southern Germany, uh, he could understand and talk with. And uh, he never talked it at home mm -hmm. because uh, he didn't want us to have the accent because uh, the Germans were extremely uh, 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 discriminated against in World War I in Ellis County. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's that's a fact, and he would not speak the German yeah. at home because, because of the stigma. Yeah, involved. yeah stigma. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I never learned German, but uh, he could he could converse with them. And but they we had uh, and putting up the grain the silage, we had wagons, and the dad had rigged an elevator on a one row corn uh, corn binder mm -hmm. to el at least it lift it up to the the. Uh, trailer mm -hmm. and a hay rack, but we had to put a, a stand on the back of it, a little uh, thing for the guard to stand. Oh, kind of a platform a area. Platform. Uh -huh. The guard uh -huh. went with us to the field uh -huh. in the first year. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and one of the experiences we had that was kind of negative, otherwise we had a good positive, but uh, we had a truck that we put a flatbed on and hauled, uh, also hauled uh, the, the bundles of uh, sorghum up mm -hmm. to the, the silage chopper. Uh, he got in the truck and we heard him wind up the truck pretty wide and he let out the clutch and ran into the side of the barn. <laughs> and the barn was concrete. So <laughs> it was a wow. 1936 Chevrolet. So <laughs> Or used to be. Uh, uh, uh -huh. There are no repairs, but fortunately it was just all uh, fenders and hood and stuff. <laughs> it wasn't the, the uh, stuff that had, we didn't have to replace anything on the truck other than sheet metal. But And that was the German that was driving? That was the German. Uh -huh. uh, he didn't come back again. Ah. Uh, I, we heard that he was sort of in disciplinary. They, I don't know if they had a little disciplinary place here mm -hmm. or something, but uh, it's kind of interesting because no officers were with them. Mm -hmm. Uh, at least out in the field. Now, maybe an officer was here helped administer. I'm not sure what Joe uh, had on that, but uh -huh. uh, the Geneva Convention was that you d did not work the officers. Mm -hmm. And uh, so... Uh, now, the, your dad would uh, pick up the prisoners, right, yeah, from yeah, the Ag Center yeah. and transport them to the farm. Yes. They'd work during the day, yeah, yeah. and then he'd take them yeah, back yes. in the evening. Yes. Uh, he paid them, right? Yeah, I don't know what the arrangements were on that. It was uh, uh, minimum wage was probably twenty-five cents mm -hmm. then, but yeah. who yeah. knows? But uh, they uh, they appreciated it. But at meal time, uh, back to that, uh, we we in our family, nobody sat down until mom and dad sat down, mm -hmm. and. Uh, so they, they would, they, they were, that's the way we ran our meals and then we'd sit down and dad would uh, give the blessing mm -hmm. and then we'd eat. And one day while we were eating, we, dad had a picture of our, the, from the fatherland of our, uh, where we came from, Traben Trabach on the Moselle River, uh, a, a picture of the town and the mountains and so on. All of a sudden, one of the prisoners jumped up and, you know, talking about it. 
he was from that area. He knew oh, it. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> so, so he uh, he came back several times. And you, usually, you had this about the same same people mm -hmm. once you because there's a little training, you know, and right. teamwork and so on. That's they the, would come back from come, yes, time to time, yeah, year yeah, to year, yeah, even. Yeah. Well, I don't know from. Uh, Year it was generally year, but, from but, from season to yeah, season. The second year we had them, there was more relaxed, and then uh, after the uh, VE day in Europe, they didn't even send the guards out. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, at that point, some of the prisoners would ask uh, Dad uh, the possibilities of of coming back or the mm -hmm. possibility to stay in here. But mm -hmm. the way the uh, Geneva Convention is, it was mandatory they be sent back to Germany mm -hmm. and uh, it wasn't good over there at all. Uh, they knew it uh, at that time but uh, you just see the change from uh, arrogance or you know uh, anger uh, then to mm -hmm. uh, once they accepted the family routines and knew that we were take care of them and and feed them and uh, they appreciated all that. And well, you I, mentioned, Harold, that they became much like members of the family. Yes, yes. Uh, um, the uh, and it's kind of funny, you know, the, where we lived down there. We bought that property in 1960 from Mike Unrine, mm -hmm. and out in his shed, the prisoners that he had had work for them signed their names and their address in Germany and stuff up on the wall. But that is all, that was 60 years ago, <laughs> so uh, uh, that has all uh, been uh, uh, faded out now. But uh, they wanted, like like we sign our names on mm -hmm. a, uh, carve our name initials on a park bench or something, you know, mm -hmm. they were leaving their name mm -hmm. over here, so. Well, it's kind of the same way as uh, we are in the Hay Barn here at the Agricultural Research Center south of Hayes. And uh, the best way to resurrect the POW memory is to climb into this hayloft of the feed barn that served as the sleeping quarters. The cables on which the POWs hung their clothes still stretch across the length of the building. And the names of some of the prisoners clearly visible in white chalk, just as they were written by the Germans themselves over 60 years ago. A group photo of some of the POWs on file of the center's office with the names on the back of the photo allows one to match faces with the names that are written in the feed barn. And those are just some of the uh, remembrances that uh, have taken place with uh, former County Commissioner Harold Krauss and uh, retired dairy farmer, I'm uh, supposed to say now, Bob Vinder, who joined us today. And our thanks to Jordan Schaefer and to uh, uh, Jeff Durall as well, our producers of the series. Uh, from the Agricultural Research Center, and a special thanks again to uh, John Yeager, who put together much of the information for us and for filling in today, uh, Weather Observer and Staff Associate Joe Becker, for our community connection. Thanks for watching. Angels Care Home Health, serving Hayes and the surrounding areas, is a Medicare-certified home health agency providing quality skilled nursing and restorative therapy services to patients in their homes. And the angel care nurse comes to see me once a week. Angels Care is there to help 24 hours a day, and all services are covered 100% by Medicare for patients who are eligible. Angel Care has helped to, to stay home. Angels Care Home Health. We serve patients.